Ladies and gentlemen, AMD's Zen 5 processors are shaping up to be very interesting and we're starting to get a much better picture now of what we can expect in terms of the architecture for these new processors. For example, we know that there's going to be 8-core CCDs and SMT2. But while some of the basics are now pretty much set in stone and we're getting even the more detailed architecture stuff as well start to become more solidified, there are still some confusing aspects and one of those is IPC. Recently, a slide has leaked online which touts a rather more conservative figure in terms of IPC over Zen 4 than perhaps many of us were expecting. And quite honestly, it's received quite a lot of pushback on Twitter and also some of my sources as well. I decided to do some investigation and maybe try to make some sense of all of this. And well, that's what we're going to be doing in this very video. Also want to give you guys a small update as well for Blackwell. And as you can imagine, we're going to get into all of this and more after this message from the video sponsor. This Halloween is a perfect chance to save even more money off of your Windows 10 or 11 keys at whokeys.com, today's video sponsor. Not only are WhoKeys offering huge discounts off of a range of CD keys, including of course Windows, but you can get an extra 25% off using the code RGT. You can find Windows 10, 11, as well as various Microsoft Office packages, or if you're a budding developer, even Visual Studios. And of course, it goes without saying, there's a large library of games all at reduced prices. You can use our code RGT to get a huge discount on this entire range of software. I have personally tested the purchase experience using their own personal account, and I've also had various friends try it out as well, and the whole process has been very simple. Just navigate to the product you want to buy, click buy now, and you'll be led straight to the basket where you can add a discount code, again, RGT, for a further 25% off of the hugely reduced Halloween sale price, and then of course it will be sent straight to you. Thanks again to whokeys.com for sponsoring today's video. Speaking historically, Zen 2 and 3 were pretty significant changes both architecturally and IPC-wise over their respective predecessors. Zen 4 didn't retain the same focus. Modest IPC gains were present, of course, but the real driving force behind Zen 4's performance advantage over Zen 3 were its clock frequencies. They saw a significant uptick over their predecessors, essentially putting AMD in close lockstep with Intel's 12th and 13th generation chips. Now, many leaks have surfaced that Zen 5 flips this script, and I won't go through all of this information again because, well, it's not really the main focus of the video, and I've gone over this quite a few times already, but you can see a general slide on screen that I've been using for the past few months. There have been a couple of updates here or there, but largely speaking, for the past few months, it's been largely unchanged. Now, to be clear, this is in reference to the desktop CPU's Granite Ridge, which of course will form the basis of Ryzen 8000. There will be a lot of uh, parallels between, let's say, this and mobile, this and server, but obviously there will also be some differences, for example, the AM5 platform. I'm not going to, as I said, go through all of this stuff, but one of the big ones you'll notice is IPC gains between 20 and 30% 1T. High seems more likely, at least what I was hearing at that point anyway, according to sources, but I'm remaining skeptical. And that's because, quite frankly with you guys, I was just hearing so many different figures and it was quite confusing. Additionally, a few days ago, a source of mine who's been really accurate in the past also claimed that Zen 5 vanilla Ryzen 8000 series chips on average will decently outperform Ryzen 7000 X3D variants in gaming applications. I actually tweeted about this as well in a thread um, on, well, X. Really weird to say X and Twitter now. It's weird. Uh, but with Kepler L2. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's gaming applications across the board. Now, from what I was told, the IPC ranges I was given just from multiple people were massive. But to add complexity, the numbers were from normally excellent sources, and much of their information, such as, say, cache, architecture, was all relatively similar. So they were all singing from pretty much the same, you know, song sheet, but... They were giving me different performance numbers, which is always kind of confusing. Recently, there was a slide leak from Tom over at Moore's Law is Dead, and his slide seemed to confirm and elaborate on some of the architecture information that I'd been releasing, but the IPC gains 
seem to be on the lower end of the spectrum, much lower than a lot of my sources were predicting. Now, obviously, this made my brain go short circuit, and I was basically like, yeah, what the hell's going on? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So I decided to do some digging. Now, from what I was told from multiple people, the benchmarks seem to be from Spec Int 2017. Of course, this could be incorrect, but that's what I was told from a few people. But the slides also seem to be older. Now, you can get this hint pretty easily. You just look at the slide and you can see that the product dates are, well, a little, you know, old. But um, I did continue to dig and I was told some interesting things. So this is something I've mentioned several times in the past, but this was really reinforced to me. Zen 5's architecture is very, very different. So because of this, in turn, different workloads, i.e. applications and the use of various aspects of the CPU, like integer units, caches, blah, 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 they will all push different figures. And this is going to be something that we see in server and desktop workloads. And I was told that for this specific benchmark, it was essentially testing things from the perspective of a server. I was also told that the results are probably underselling the CPU's performance, but I was also given another very interesting hint, and that is single thread versus MT. Now, this gets more complicated, unfortunately, because I had some mixed messaging whether this is multi-thread, as in, you know, multiple processor cores, or SMT workloads. Um, so, in other words, one core running multiple threads. But potentially, we're seeing a reduction in scaling of SMT slash MT versus single thread for Zen 5. Now, this does make some sense because a lot of the IPC metrics I'd been receiving were single thread. And early on, one of the consistent things that I'd been hearing personally is Zen 5's architecture was basically aiming to be very, very single thread focused. Now, as always with this stuff, it's gonna be really interesting to see what is and isn't true. My personal opinion is I, I don't really wanna get my own hopes up. I'm personally thinking like high teens is probably quite realistic, but again, what is the average workload? And it's also gonna be very interesting to see how this processor series is going to scale with different memory configurations, i.e. what happens if you're running it with sluggish memory versus much higher memory? Obviously, that will affect performance, but how much? What about different workloads, etc., etc., etc.? It's going to be very interesting to see how this runs across a, bo a broad excuse me, variety of different applications. Now, I do think AMD focusing significantly on single thread does make a lot of sense, just generally in terms of the market. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens going forward from AMD, you know, with Zen 6 onwards. Now, speaking of Zen 6, I also want to give you guys a very small update for Zen 6. So, also in the same slide for Moore's Law, um, it does mention some Zen 6 stuff. And it said that it does go up to 32 cores. I was told by one source this is the dense variant. Not too surprising, but it is nice to get some type of clarification. I was told that standard is 16, but there's a little complexity because I have one source somewhat contradicting this because they state that the desktop and mobile could remain as only eight. Now, this becomes actually quite interesting because, and I've reported this previously, the desktop variant of Zen 6, which I assume will be Ryzen 9000, unless there's some type of like refresh or AMD just decides to call it like Ryzen 10 for the, you know, just a trollus or something. But I was basically told the desktop variant will be much closer in terms of the mobile design, i.e. it will retain the same IOD, basically speaking. Now, what isn't clear here is how this is going to work because we know AMD are going to double and triple down on its you know, C variants, it's low power cores. For example, will we see on the mobile eight cores, which are the regular cores and eight cores for um, the C variants on different CCXs? So CCX zero would be the regular cores and then CC, uh, CCD one, excuse me, would be on the, you know, the, 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 the dense cores. I don't know. And it's going to be very interesting to see how this affects mobile, uh, sorry, mobile versus desktop. So I'm going to be very interested to see how all of this turns out because Zen six, obviously, you know, from everything that's been said online, and also I've been reporting this kind of 
regularly as well. Zen 6 isn't a huge IPC uplift. It's basically some architectural changes, some tweaks to um, caches, some stuff to the IO and so on. It's also quite unknown at this stage whether it's gonna remain on AM5 or shift to another platform. I'll say for the sake of this video, AM6, but for all I know, it could be, you know, it, it could be called anything. It could be called Seagull for all I know. But um, yeah, it's gonna be quite curious because there seems to be some essential pushback. Some folks are stating that um, AMD, basically speaking, have this internal debate whether they should shift this next generation Ryzen to an entirely new platform or whether it should remain on the same platform as it is now. I also want to give you guys an update concerning NVIDIA's Blackwell. Um, so AGF on Twitter, who back in the days of RTX 40 was leaking some stuff concerning those GPUs, they state that uh, Blackwell is also going to be monolithic because I, obviously RDNA 4 won't compete. So uh, this is the kind of interesting thing because allegedly NVIDIA were considering a crazy MCM monster with HBM for its top SKU. So this is all going to be focused now towards the data center. Now, I will say I'm not exactly surprised. This is not new information that, of course, it's going to be gone, going monolithic. I've reported it multiple times, and I'm certainly not the only one. Copperite 7 Kimmy has, you know, said much the same thing. But this does reinforce that it obviously kind of basically is the... Uh, it's, it's basically NVIDIA will do anything to win when it comes to performance. Like, you know, they don't care the... They don't necessarily care whether it's... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Realistic for that person to buy the flagship. Like, for example, what we've seen with the Titans. What they care about is that their GPU is the fastest on the actual benchmarks. Now, it's going to be very interesting, to be honest, to see what the timings for all of this are. I did mention in a previous video, and I'm just going to really quickly repeat this. To my understanding, Q3 uh, next year, so that's 2024, will be RDNA 4, but as we've discussed a billion times, they're not going to be high-end products. Uh, they're going to be basically a little bit under the 7900 XT for the highest end SKU. Uh, you can check my previous video out where I go over the performance targets for N44 and 48. And then you're going to get Blackwell. Depending on who you ask, that's Q4 2024. But I think that's probably more likely to not happen. I think that we're going to see 2024 for the um, HPC slash DC release. I think it's much more realistic for us to see the gaming variants in the first half of 2025, which means that depending on how the chips may fall, if you excuse the pun, we should probably see RDNA 5 launch between six and nine months later, again, depending on exact time windows for both. So RDNA 5 will obviously be much faster. So the question is, one, will RDNA 5 be fast enough to compete with RTX 50 whatever it ends up being or will nvidia decide to release some type of refresh or will nvidia sandbag hold back the highest end products and then release a variant which is much 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 faster so we could see a situation like if we very quickly use the power of the internet and look at let's say the specifications of the gtx 980 uh, the 980 had uh, 2048 CUDA cores, and that was based on GM204, of course, and then GM200 had 2816 for the GTX 980 Ti. You can check my tech power up or, well, basically anything to see those results. Or if we were to go to a more recent example, the GTX 1080, which, of course, was based upon... Um, uh, GP104 that had 2560 CUDA cores. I'm, you know, not talking about anything more than I'm just going to keep things very simple in terms of specifications. And we have 3584 for the 1080 Ti. So that's based, of course, on GP102. So it's going to be very interesting if NVIDIA decides, well, you know what, gosh, we're just going to release the 5080 um and we're gonna have i don't know 60 percent just for example i'll pull a number out of my ass 
60 percent of the you know the highest end SKU that we could possibly release and then they end up releasing a much more powerful variant it's going to be very interesting to see what nvidia's strategy is for that and then obviously um it's going to be well this is not a leak this is just speculative it's probably going to be like two years later that we get the um the the 60 series so i'll be very curious to see what the strategy is for both companies so there you have it guys honestly when it comes to zen 5 i'm trying to not get my hopes up, up too much because well at the end of the day it's always healthy i think to have some level of skepticism but i will be very interested to see how all of this shapes up going forward because we do know of course that intel with the 15th generation of CPUs, which of course will be Arrowlake, will have a pretty big departure in terms of just the overall structure and the way that Intel are approaching things. We know, for example, well, we say we know, of course, at the end of the day, these are rumors and so on and so on, but it seems very likely at this point that hyperthreading is removed from the Lion Cove processors, which it's just going to be very interesting over the next couple of generations to see how both companies end up. As for the GPU roadmap, well, <laughs> yeah, I will be very curious to see how the chips may fall because while we spoke a lot about RDNA and of course Blackwell in this video, the low to mid range is also going to be quite intriguing because of course AMD as well as uh, Intel will be fighting things out with the APU side of things and Battle Mage is another, well, it's another point of interest I will be very interested to see what Intel's software stack is like at that point as well. Um, XCSS has come quite far, but uh, at the end of the day, things are going to be very interesting. And that's to say nothing of the console-related stuff as well. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on all of this, and also where you kind of are sitting in terms of upgrades. Like, are you interested in upgrading a CPU or GPU, or are you just going to kind of sit on it? I mean, let's face it, we know that you know, there's going to be RTX 60 and stuff like that. So if you're sitting on like a 4090, yeah, sure, the 5090 is probably going to be quite tempting, but do you really need it? Well, let me know. Let me, let me know your thoughts down below, guys. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.